Um, it's fantastic to be here today. Uh, and it really, uh, I'm glad the previous question was asked of how do we find uh, training data that's a representative of uh, variation in the environments that we care to deploy our systems in? Because that'll be one of the themes that I touch on later in the talk. How do we have uh, adaptive systems um, and use synthetic generation models in particular to add the variation into uh, machine learning systems that can make them robust to uh, various performance. And what I have half an hour, right? I'm, I'm supposed to end uh, um, just after the hour, I assume. Yes. So I want to touch on one of the um, hot new topics in AI, uh, and that's uh, the the pivot from a, a fully supervised paradigm to a paradigm that's more unsupervised or self-supervised. This is a something that a lot of people are talking about. It's a big theme at Berkeley. Uh, Jan LeCun and others have also referred to it um, using one of Alyosha Efros's slides in the middle here, the revolution will not be supervised. And uh, one of Jan LeCun's slides on the right there referring to the, the you know, the cake. Uh, um, supervised learning is just the icing. The, the, the real material is, is in the middle. Uh, and, and it's been showing revolutionary performance across a range of AI tech, uh, AI areas in vision. Uh, the dominant paradigm is what's called self-supervised representation learning. Um, and the idea is not just to do simple clustering, but to actually learn tasks that are derived from the data itself. Uh, and three uh, exemplary uh, tasks are shown here, context prediction, colorization, rotation prediction. These are tasks where you can get the labels from the data itself. That's why we call it self-supervised. You can take a color image, make it grayscale, and then ask a machine learning algorithm to predict the color. <laughs> you can take an image in a canonical orientation, flip it to a random orientation, <clears throat> and see if the uh, and train a machine learning algorithm, a supervised column net to predict uh, the canonical orientation, and, or you can solve a jigsaw problem. Uh, and these have been shown to to survival and and uh, in some cases exceed the performance of uh, supervised learning such as uh, ImageNet um, with just labels alone. But wait, uh, I'm, I'm a little worried. Uh, and I'm a little worried with some of the way that the existing literature so far has been presented. Um, because it turns out uh, that the there's actually knowledge of the task that's being exploited in the dominant self-supervised learning techniques. And I think one can criticize the approach as just uh, actually hand engineering augmentation strategies. And that's still a very useful thing to do um, because it turns out it's it's just a different kind of knowledge, right? You, you, you're basically telling the model with human expertise, what are the invariances of a target domain or a downstream task? And adding that in, in the form of these invariances that are represented by these self-supervised tasks, but there's but if you if you guess wrong, or if you take what the paper authors chose to do to get their numbers up on uh, the tasks they published in their paper, you know, ImageNet or Coco or something, uh, and your your task is different. It's a it's a snowy sweet, snowy scene in Sweden, uh, or a uh, wildfire sky in in the Bay Area. Um, uh, well, and your, your performance may be quite poor. So in the first part of this talk, I'm gonna describe new methods for self-supervised learning that can have the advantages of self-supervised models, but don't make uh, undue reliance on either implicit or explicit assumptions about what uh, augmentation strategies are appropriate in the downstream task. <laughs> so to prove my point that, that I just made, here's a, figure that we've stolen from the, um, I think this is from the MoCo paper, one of the, a Simclear paper, sorry, um, where basically they're very honest about the fact that they cross-validate over all of the possible augmentations, these synthetic transformations that they're adding to their data uh, uh, to create variations that are supervised tasks for which representation learning is done. They search and decide which ones are actually useful given knowledge of the downstream task, given supervised feedback. Uh, and they discover that some 
are useful and some aren't, and they pick the ones that are useful. Um, that's supervised, right? So there's this sort of somewhat cheeky uh, comment um, about, you know, unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning. What, what do these people do when the unlabeled data is actually unlabeled, right? Um, and, uh, and so we're, we've uh, started to look into this. And we have a couple different, at least the first two are directly relevant to this line of reasoning. And then the third one uh, is more of a pure domain annotation flavor that I'll get into in some detail. <laughs> so what I mean by fully unsupervised or fully self-supervised is no target or downstream labels, no implicit knowledge, no source data, uh, or no source labels at, at test time, and certainly no source images even. And that's what's new about our domain annotation technique. We don't even, the third method I'm about to present. It doesn't even require a representation of the distribution at test time. So the first paper is called, What Should Not Be Contrastive in Contrastive Learning? Um, and contrastive learning is one of the um, pretty uh, successful and famous approaches to self-supervised learning. It's basically a deep um, formulation of the, the paradigm I expressed earlier, where you take a, an original image and you uh, make a transformation of that and you, you um, transform it with some augmentation. Maybe in this case, it's been colorized and rotated. And we do uh, uh, Siamese style network learning where we say learn an embedding where the query image and its transformed partner map to the same point in an embedding space and other random pairs of images map somewhere else. Um, but as I said, this has the problem of uh, essentially assuming you know what your downstream tasks are. <clears throat> uh, and there are many different kinds of augmentations that one can imagine, color, rotation, and texture are illustrated here. Um, and for different downstream tasks, uh, different augmentations turn out to help performance. If you're really doing coarse-grained classification, like ImageNet, um, turns out rotation is not a good augmentation to add because the sort of orientation of the object actually is informative to its class label. Um, and if you're doing fine grain recognition, like bird classification, um, you probably don't even want to do color augmentation or texture augmentation, because at least the way it's been proposed in the literature so far prior to our work, it actually um, dulls the representation with regard to those uh, attributes and features, and that's not desirable for fine grain recognition. And last but not least, uh, a different fine grain recognition model uh, doesn't like uh, color and texture augmentation don't help, but actually rotation and variance does help. So, the, so unless you know ahead of time which of these tasks your model is going to be trained on, you don't know ahead of time which augmentations to use. So that's why we uh, developed a new kind of self-supervised um, multi-augmentation strategy called LUC, Leave One Out Contrastive Learning. And the idea is actually to do multi-task or multi-head contrastive learning. Um, but each head actually learns all but one of, or each head is trained using all but one of the augmentations. So there'll be some embedding space where rotation is not uh, diluted. It's, it's rotation still matters. So there'll be some, color, some embedding space where color still matters. And there'll be some embedding space where they're all there, just like in traditional contrastive learning. Uh, and we'll actually look both at the concatenation of those three layers and one layer below those three layers and explore those as representations. Um, and the, uh, if I had more time, I'd get into this slide in a little more detail. For specific instance images or data sets, you can see, you, you can uh, visualize which of those heads mattered more. And it turns out to you know, match our intuitions about what's relevant in each data set. Uh, and I'll, I, I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of time, not go through all the numbers and all the tables, uh, but the punchline of this is uh, compared, for example, to MoCo, our method does no harm. It does almost as good or, or actually uh, just slightly better than the baseline MoCo, which is a you know, highly engineered model on the data set that MoCo is good at, ImageNet. 
but on all the other data sets where the assumptions change and the, and the MoCo authors would have to go manually retune their system to make it work on iNaturalist or Cub or Flowers, our method uh, gets significantly improved performance and essentially automatically learns which parts of the representations are relevant uh, on the task. And this is if you do uh, recognition after pre-training on ImageNet 100 on these target tasks. And we also have some large scale experiments that you can check about and check in the paper on um, um, MoCo uh, um, on iNaturalist 1K tested on ImageNet 1K. So that's cool. Uh, that's a, a, a new, a cool new idea on how we can extend contrastive learning to a multi-headed approach that uh, sort of in, inherently picks what's important for a downstream task. Uh, a complementary approach we learned, we've discovered, uh, is work in collaboration with Kurt Kreutzer's group on automatically learning augmentation uh, strategies. So I know a big theme of today's meeting is uh, virtual and synthetic worlds. We saw some good work in the previous talk, um, but again, how to how to decide and, and and those the general paradigm can be used as I've um, already suggested to generate variation in your training data to add. Um, uh, robustness to uh, uh, desired, uh, and you know what, what you expect, how you expect the world to change in the future. Um, how how to figure out which ones to use uh, for you know, especially in the strategy that I've uh, just outlined. Uh, it turns out that there's a meta task in rotation prediction itself. Um, here, fine grain, here's sort of small rotation prediction, not necessarily the the coarse rotation prediction. Um, establishes which augmentations are going to work in the real world. So the these plots here sort of tell the whole story. Uh, if you take a transformation, uh, like translation, uh, and you um, try to see which augmentations or parameters of that augmentation is best going to predict the performance of models with that augmentation, um, the, uh, linear, the, the accuracy of linear rotation prediction turns out to have uh, the best performance. Uh, and we see this across a whole range of uh, different um, uh, data sets. Uh, and, uh, and so the, it's, a, it's a very simple story here as well. Actually, this, this one is much simpler than the previous story. Um, rotation prediction can actually be a meta um, augmentation strategy to predict which augmentation, which augmentation strategies to use and further which parameters of the augmentation strategies to set. Um, so we call this method uh, self-augment. Uh, and again, in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all the numbers, but refer you to our paper and uh, show that the, uh, there's significant improvement uh, across a whole range of, of data sets. Uh, and there's a lot of future work combining the two methods that I've just ex explored or just re uh, presented to you um, and also looking at how it might um, uh, if it work for other aspects of representation learning. And then the last in this triptych of um, uh, fully uh, uh, self-supervised and adaptive methods is uh, work that's uh, led by Deshaun Lang and joined with Evan Shellhammer at Adobe, and it's certainty as supervision for fully test time adaptation. Uh, and I'm going to actually use a similar task as was introduced in the previous talk, so I don't have to explain to you what cityscapes is or what semantic segmentation is. Uh, we're obviously taking images, in these case street scene images from cityscapes, and trying to predict class labels that represent some sort of driving or scene affordance, whether it's a car, motorcycle, tree, or road, for example. And think bad things can happen. You can wake up one morning, such as we did uh, during our wildfire season uh, this year, uh, and suddenly discover that the sky has changed color. The world was orange for a day in the Bay Area. Um, actually, the air quality wasn't that bad that day. It was very strange. The air quality got much worse on the non-orange day. Uh, I think the, the air, the um, smoke was at a higher elevation and not at ground level on that particular day. 
But no surprise, well, actually, no, no surprise to anyone who does computer vision, probably a surprise to the people who don't understand computer vision or AI and purchase models from vendors. The semantic segmentation models that otherwise would work pretty reasonably on a scene like this, just because the, the whole image changed color, um, do quite poorly. And that's really undesirable. And in fact, as a human, you know just by looking at this output that it's wrong, right? There's something that just the entropy or the uncertainty in this output looks really messed up. Uh, and indeed, um, using a fully test time adaptation approach, just by looking at the outputs of at the um, logits of the representation and adding a mechanism to adapt them, without, of course, reliance on any labels in the target environment, because in any real world application, there's no, no time to call back and get more images annotated before your car has to drive into a, a new area or your vehicle perform or a new mission. Um, and with no knowledge of the source distribution in, in raw form, we don't need to do an alignment stage here. Um, we're able to significantly improve the performance uh, from something like this, to something like this, from something like this, to something like this, and so forth. And that's it. So how, how do we do this? Uh, and, and how does this fit in the panoply of adaptation schemes? Uh, you know, if you had labels, which we don't, you could certainly do fine tuning. If you had a source representation, uh, which we don't, we, we, our group has done a lot of work on unsupervised domain adaptation where you do distribution alignment. I still like that idea. Um, but here we have no labels and we don't even have a representation of the source distribution. Here, uh, and we, we could do self-supervised test time training, much like the previous methods. Uh, but again, you'd need to know ahead of time which invariances are appropriate in that new domain and which ones aren't. For example, color isn't. So I'm gonna skip over the background slides that explained all those three things and just say that we don't do that. We do fully test time adaptation. And the mechanism is very simple. Add a kind of affine transformation uh, to uh, you know, all the layers in the model uh, and adapt those to minimize the entropy of the model outputs um, at test time. It's kind of like an adaptive batch norm. Uh, there's, some, there's been a literature on that type of work for domain adaptation, but um, this is a new, uh, a completely new uh, approach and model and the results are quite, uh, quite strong. I won't go into complete details of the model in the interest of time. Let me just go through an example of what it does and how it works. Uh, here, a very, very simple model, CIFAR 10. It's, it's shocking how uh, bad performance can be on a very simple task with a simple corruption that's outside of the um, domain on which the model's trained. Uh, uh, this very simple model would only get 4% error when fully supervised. And here it's trying to predict uh, of course, a digit, the ground truth digit is uh, boxed in red. Um, and if you add, and I think it's so, if, you know, uncorrupted error, it would almost always have a big bar right on the, um, on the, on the highlighted digit. If I just do Gaussian noise corruption to the model and I haven't you know, trained the model robustly for Gaussian noise, performance can be very poor. Uh, for example, the, the orange, performance is performance of an unadapted model on the noise corrupted imagery. The threes look like sixes. Uh, the, the twos look like threes and the fives seem to look like fours with, with Gaussian noise. And just with this uh, fully test time adaptation model, which says let's adapt an affine transformation, let's find an invariant representation on this data set that kind of makes some sense. Uh, we get much stronger performance moving from the orange bars to the blue bars. Uh, and in this case, it would uh, the, the peak of those blue bars would have actually gotten the right answer for all three of these cases. And before adaptation, all three of them would have been wrong. Uh, so we, you know, we can keep running these experiments on larger data sets with more complexity. Uh, CIFAR 100, indeed, with uh, uh, performance can actually get much uh, can suffer dramatically. Here we're looking at accuracy. Um, so um, 
now I think we're looking at error on the bottom. Uh, the error of adding mo um, I'm sorry, I think we are looking at accuracy and showing how accuracy improves with our method when we're adapting. So with motion blur, uh, accuracy drops from 79% to 44%. Our method brings it up to 69%. And you can see similar uh, examples, again, Gaussian noise, just that level of Gaussian noise that you see there can drop performance from 79% to 10%, which is crazy. Uh, and uh, without knowledge ahead of time that we're trying to be invariant to Gaussian noise versus other noises, this adaptation method will at least bring performance back to 50%, which is a pretty big improvement in the, the accuracy. Um, details in the paper, uh, one cool thing is this is architecture invariance. This, this could work on any architecture. So feel free to try this on your favorite architecture and your data. And there are more, more experiments in the paper that I'll be happy to share with you. Uh, or that that, you, that is available online that you can take a look at and that I'm going to skip now uh, in the interest of time, including digit recognition um, and more cityscapes examples. And that's sort of the time series of adaptation is kind of fun to watch here, or the time course of adaptation. This is before, uh, without an adaptation. And as the model adapts, you can see it improve and kind of lock into a good answer. Good. So that was that story. I've given you these three ideas on self and unsupervised learning. And in the five minutes that I have left, I want to take a small, uh, quick tour through advisable and explainable AI. Um, and uh, that's another big interest of mine, uh, in addition to building models that are robust and performant and invariant to noise. Um, how do we make them more explainable and trustworthy and actually even better uh, by making them more explainable and trustworthy? And a, a lot of Criticism has been leveled at uh, deep learning for being a black box. Um, and there's this cartoon that's often put forward of a trade-off between accuracy and explainability that one needs to uh, uh, pick from. Would you like your model to work or be explainable? And, and no one's happy with that trade-off. So we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna, we're gonna do research which shows how we can take the most performant models, these, deep learning neural network models and make them more explainable. Uh, and in fact, also make them more performant as they become explainable. And um, you know, the reason that's gonna work to, in a nutshell is explanations and interpretability actually are like telling a student that they should show their work. And it's not just show their work because it feels good or because it makes you trust uh, yourself or the student, but actually, being able to not just predict the label, but also predict the rationale or predict what evidence to rely on is an, is an important source of additional training data. So we get additional loss in our model with an explainable uh, and advisable perspective. And by transducing in particular image and text, we'll move from textual rationales to textual advice where we can actually train or influence a system uh, and maybe an image-based system, not with clicks or boxes, but with natural language. So that's the story that I'll go through in the next four or five minutes. Um, old models, for, uh, what, uh, very popular and sometimes useful, but often questionable approach is uh, salience for introspection. Uh, there have been models such as Lime and GradCam and Rise uh, RISE actually works uh, pretty well in, in many situations, and it is useful uh, to explain uh, to a, a user and show what is the uh, which pixels in a model are being used to make a certain decision. If I took the image on the left and I and my system classifies it as sheep, uh, you know, you'd like to see, uh, but you know, but, uh, or sorry, if, it, if the image on the, if I give the image on the left to my system and it, it actually classifies it as cow, you're like, what? There's no cow in that image. But if you look at the saliency map or the rise map, you can see, um, oh, it's looking at this other cow-like object. And I can see why that might be misinterpreted. And so you can use that to go back and teach a model that it should, um, actually rely on things that are important in this scene. Uh, and in particular for sources of bias, we may not want gender 
uh, distinctions to be made uh, based on context in some cases. We may, we may want to rely on um, uh, you know, properties uh, or apparent properties of, uh, of an individual, not the fact that they're sitting in a kitchen or sitting in, um, uh, in an office. Uh, baseline models for image captioning we observed in a paper a year or two ago um, and that's uh, titled at the bottom of the slide, would rely on whether the person was in the kitchen or the office to decide whether to caption it as man or woman. When we added these constraints that it should actually just look at the person to make this distinction. Um, and, um, and in fact, there's much more subtlety to this problem than I'm expressing in this slide. Um, uh, it was able to become right for the right reasons and uh, be able to not use context when context is inappropriate. And so I think the big theme here is not that there's a single setting of context that's right or wrong. Maybe even appearance isn't the right thing to rely on to decide what, what, uh, what word to use here. Um, but you can't get rid of all context in machine learning. There's no, there's no learning without context. You know, actually bias in a machine learning sense is often good. We want models that exploit useful bias but where we can control and remove bias that's inappropriate because of social constructs. Um, so um, last few minutes here, uh, not only do we look into these saliency models uh, for um, uh, introspection and causality, express the causality of a model, but we also look at justification models, which are essentially image caption engines conditioned on uh, decisions. Uh, and which can be trained with expert rationales. So if I want to do a, a classification task or question answer task, um, it's useful not just to say it's a cardinal, for the system to sit, not just say it's a cardinal, but tell you why, tell you the what are the features of a cardinal that make a cardinal a cardinal that, that were observable in this image. And so we've had a line of work in this direction uh, dating back to 2016. Um, and in a nutshell, here's, the distinction of an image caption is relevant to the image, a definition is relevant to a class, this visual explanation is relevant to both. Uh, I can't see any chat message. If somebody's trying to send me a message, I can't see it. So just tell me when I need to stop. I should be done in about two minutes. Um, and not only can you generate or train on textual explanations, um, but textual justifications, I'm not, we're not asserting here there's necessarily a causal link between the explanation and the internal functioning of the model. As much as it's a big point that we could, that, you know, I should go on at length if I had time, but that's the distinction between these two different flavors of explanation, justification and, and introspection. Uh, but this is still super useful um, because it can improve the performance of a trained model to force it to predict evidence that's consistent with what an expert would have said to predict um, and to ground it. Uh, and also it, it can generate, I'm missing this. Oh, this, sorry, this is the counterfactual slide. You can not only have evidence why something is uh, the correct label, <clears throat> you can do the counterfactual of why isn't this uh, a scarlet tanager. And you can uh, roll out what experts would have said if it was a scarlet tanager, that there'd be black wings. Uh, and you can say, I tried really hard to ground the black wings phrase in my textual explanation that an expert would have expected for this image, and it's not there. So I can actually tell you this is not a scarlet tanager because it doesn't have black wings. Um, this, as I said, improves the performance of a model uh, and also may be useful to teach people. But ultimately, uh, as we've shown, this is collaboration with John Canney at, at Berkeley, can move from explanations for advice to advice for learning. Um, learning to explain leads to explaining to learn. And what John and his students have, uh, in collaboration with my group, have worked on is showing that you can have explanations in driving, both the sort of causal salience type that I've just uh, shown earlier, and the textual type, where we have a data set where someone's done sort of the driving direct driving instructors um, you know, narration of what's going on in the in the in the driving, 
Uh, and we can turn this uh, around. Oh, here's a video of this, which might or might not may or may not play. So, you know, textual explanations coming along the line. This is an ECCV 18 paper if you're interested. Uh, but we move from explanations that the system generates to um, show to the user to advice that a user can kind of be a backseat driver and tell the system what to do. Uh, and I'm just going to put this one slide up and have to end in the interest of time. But you can look at our most recent uh, 2020 paper where the main idea is now that we have a system that can kind of tell textual stories about what it's doing, we can now influence the system by giving it more text. And uh, the sort of the key example um, uh, from this vignette is that when we trained a naive model to do end-to-end -end driving uh, control, it turned out it didn't pay attention to pedestrians because in the training set that we had, all the pedestrians were in the crosswalks. So stopping at the crosswalk or, or, you know, people were always in crosswalks, so it could basically only look in crosswalks for people when it decided when to stop. Um, that's a bad strategy in general, especially for a held out condition where you have a jaywalker in, uh, in San Francisco or New York. Um, but by providing pedestrian, by providing advice to the model, it was able to say, pay attention to pedestrians, not just in crosswalks, but elsewhere. Uh, and improve its performance so that it didn't hit the people in the virtual environment anymore. So there's that's more on that in the 2020 paper. We need to stop for questions. Well, that's a good slide, a good good thing to do because that's my last slide. And I wanted to thank everyone for listening to my talk. Okay, we have a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, would adversarial training help in the semantic segmentation example? Yes, and adversarial training is the, method that underlines our uh, unsupervised domain alignment work that we've been doing for at least four years. We call it domain confusion. It's very related to um, gradient reversal, but with a more GAN style loss. Um, uh, but that, would that method assumes that you have the uh, uh, original source data around, um, but it but it's, could still be complementary depending on the problem state. Okay. I have one short one more. Uh... How does explainability relate to the work on robust versus non-robust features? Um, we don't have to answer. <laughs> yeah, I think they're independently good ideas. Okay. And then yeah, I have maybe a, there's a, if there's, if the questioner wants to elaborate, I'd be happy to. Yeah, 